introduction to growth theory. All right? Lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, they are very connected with one another, okay? Because second and third, it's so growth model. <coughs> introduction to growth theory. How do we measure the prosperity of a country? All right? So let's start with the statement of, who is this person? When his words are translated into more than English, okay, it looks like this. The average level of prosperity in a country can be measured by country GDP or income per person. So which means that when we would like to know whether one country is doing economically well or not, we will look at their GDP per capita. Yes? If the per capita is high, we can see that that country is doing economically well. People in that country, they are living really nice, right? If it's low, we will make a, we develop a, you know, a thinking that that country people are relatively poor. Okay? Good? So our income, right, do we consume it all? No, right? We consume part of it. This annual consumption it tells us many things, all right? Countries with more or higher income per, per capita, it, which means that they will be consuming less of it because it's too much, yes? Which means that the saving is going to be more. But in a country where it's very poor, where the income is hardly sufficient for consumption itself, which means that they will be consuming all of it. Yes? So this saving is very important. Countries with more saving, it's, you know, they are building the future because it's going to be invested in the future, okay? Which will serve for further development. Those investments will be spent for R&D and many other macroeconomic you know, tools that can be improved, all right? And it is saving that makes very different thing. Okay? And it is the source for future development. Okay? And what is the most commonly used proxy for measuring economic uh, well-being of a nation? GDP. GDP per capita, right? GDP per capita. Okay. So now let's go to three years ago when we studied our first lecture. It was globalization from our CIG, right? There, it was, I discussed it too, okay? I said, GDP per capita is really nice measure, but it still has some shortcomings that we will discuss. If you refresh your memory, I gave you this, this list of shortcomings, right? So even though the GDP per capita is good measure, it still has lots of shortcomings, right? Please review it at home. I will not explain because it will take 30 minutes, okay? So, but I will ask you during that seminar, what does it mean, what was it, okay? Good and bad. There are lots of shortcomings of GDP per capita, but this measure is considered as the best one. For comparative studies, why? Because it's the only measure, macroeconomic measure, that we can apply to all countries, for all countries. Maybe, for example, average income is a good measure, but that variable is not available for all countries. That's the issue. Okay? But there are many other variables that you may as oh, it's a better measure than per capita, but they are not available for all countries. So therefore, we use per capita. Okay? Per capita. Good. So what? The importance of growth. All economies, they grow or decline, right? So now, if you look at this graph, we are considering three African countries, Uganda, Nigeria, and Botswana, okay? So this is, you know, the data starts from 1980 to 2013, last year I drew it, okay? So if you look, these countries, they start, the economies start from different levels, right? And the average growth is also different for Botswana for these years on average was 4.8%, Uganda 
for Nigeria 3.3, for Uganda 1.6. Okay, good. Which may this growth may be really different in the long run. So Botswana, and people in Botswana, compared to U.S., they per capita made only 24% of Americans, okay? Or in Uganda, it made only 3%, therefore, per capita, okay? Good? But over the years, you can see in Nigeria, which, you know, the economy was much better compared to these two countries, over the years, as things have changed, in mid-90s, the situation in Nigeria was even worse compared to Uganda, okay? Compared to Uganda. So what happened to this country because they experienced certain crisis? You know Nigeria is an oil-rich country, right? And if you go to the history, in 19, early 1970s, what happened? There was a huge between Saudis and Americans, right? Because America, when there was in early 70s, you know, that the Egypt, Egyptians and the Israelis, they had, they were involved. Americans, they supported the Israelis. From other side, the Saudis, they said, why are you helping them? Let them fight with one another. Don't help them, right? But they were supporting them. Saudis said, what? If you are now, because now you are supporting, we will support ours. We are not, because they were totally dependent on their oil, they stopped supplying oil to the United States, right? And oil price, because there was lack of oil, there was high demand in the American economy, price skyrocketed, okay? In the early 1970s, one barrel of oil was only two, two dollars. One barrel of oil. But within four or five years, the, the, the price has jumped to $40, okay? Nigeria, which was, you know, oil-rich country, and relatively small, with population, less population, this difference makes the life very different, okay? The role of oil in early 70s was very less, but, but in, in, the, in the spending, it, it really like this group, it was growth like this because of oil. But in 1980s, what happened, things improved in Nigeria. Oh, sorry, the, the oil price, uh, the Saudis and uh, America, the oil, oil prices, you know, became stable and went down again. Nigerians lost that profit revenue, okay, from oil, and they experienced this kind of decline. This kind of decline. And why have it happened, you know, when the economy of Nigeria was growing, they were thinking that they, they, if we have oil, it's just, this is it. We don't have to care about anything. And they just forgot about their agriculture, all right? Agriculture, the share of agriculture shrink, okay? Many other sectors, you know, uh, manufacturing shrink because they thought they have a lot of oil. After the oil shock, the economy, you can see, it experienced. But, based on Botswana, you can see this is really good thing, okay? Life, which was much, you know, life living standard, which was much less compared to, to Nigerians, but people in Botswana, today they are living much better, okay? More than two times better compared to. And now I will explain, it's real G. In here, we don't consider, oh, good question. Your, in your coursework, your dependent variable should be GDP per capita. It must be real. If you consider nominal, I will reduce your mind. Good, these two. Next. If you consider Jamaica and Hong Kong, again, where Jamaicans, they were living better compared to Chinese people, Hong Kong, okay? But over the years, because of that, you know, gross miracles in this country, they are living standards over the years, it's almost like Americans. Of course, there are some cases because it, uh, until 2013, for the last two, three years, they are having certain type of, you know, uh, problems, but, you know, uh, this, it's not considered here, all right? And if you consider these two developed countries, Italy is a developed country, it was a developed country. 
in six months. Venezuela was developed country too, right? Both developed countries. But over the years, so they know people in Venezuela, they were living much better than Italians, okay? But over the years, things has changed, all right? Has changed. You know, Venezuela today, economy is experiencing crisis, yes? They experience hyperinflation, the you know, people are living in, in thousands and millions just because of avoiding that economic instability at home. Alright? So, by the Italians over the years, they did a good job. Alright? Good. How do we compare the income per person across countries? Based on per capita, right? If you want to compare them based on GDP per capita, how do we measure it? You know that right? GDP divided by population, but what about the value? All countries, whatever country it is, when data is collected, it's based on home country currency. Uzbekistan's GDP is calculated based on Uzbek sum because all interactions are in sum. In US dollars, it's illegal. Okay? It's illegal. Of course, we have certain exceptions like hotels, it's no problem for them. But in general, for transaction, it is sum, right? So they make it sum. But to make, to make a comparison, then we will make it, we will convert it into US dollars or some other. Uh, you know, international currencies like Euro, right? And we use US, US dollars because international currencies. Okay. So we use exchange rates. All right. So now we'll talk about certain other things, some problems, okay? Good. So, look. for example, in 1980s, right? because of certain economic instability in certain countries, okay? that US dollar appreciated, which means that US dollar became much stronger compared to local currency by 50%. And at the same time, it, you know, it, it you know, depreciated by 50%. Does it mean, you know, if you appreciate by 50%, does it mean that people, you know, because Uzbek soon became 50% stronger, they are living 50% better? Or we became 50% you know, richer compared to the US? No, right? No. No. And, for example, in 2011, GDP per capita of India, it was $1,529. And the same year, in the United States, per capita was close to $50,000, right? If, if you look at the real difference, now Americans' GDP per capita is 21.3% times greater. Does it mean that Americans' living standard is 31.13 times better than Indians? No, right? So which means that GDP per capita ignores this kind of things. All right? So therefore, economists to make real comparison between those economies they try to control this issue. Okay, this issue. And how do they control it? Based on EPP. Purchasing power parity. Okay, basket of goods. Purchasing power. This is important. So we we have exercises based on this one too during the our seminar, okay? You will see, you will do it by yourself. So long. GDP per capita, GDP per worker. Now we'll compare these two. And in your coursework, you may, I strongly encourage you to use per, per worker. Okay. Why? All economies, okay, they are different. So now, if you compare European countries to Asian countries, <coughs> There, in European countries, females are very active in the economy. They contribute to the economy. Okay? Because of that, one, labor participation rate in Europe is much higher compared to Asian countries. Okay? Or, in most of the developing countries, labor participation rate is much lower. Why? 
because huge informal sector, right? Huge informal sector. We know when we calculate GDP, all, all market activities that are going through official market, value pay included, right? Informal, even though you are a very good rancher, you have you know, 10,000 of goats or whatever, right? And every day you are slaughtering one goat or one sheep. And if you compare your meat consumption to others, if you are having you know, much more consumption compared to the richest of Uzbekistan, but still your consumption is ignored in the GDP, right? GDP. So therefore, to improve that problem, economies, they try to apply per work. So which means that if we have 1,000 US dollars per capita in Uzbekistan, and the, the population is 100, the per capita if we calculate is 10 dollars, right? But if you consider the per capita the labor participation rate, only among these 110 people are working in formal jobs. Which means that it is only their income, whatever consumptions are considered in here. So now the actual per capita per worker, if you calculate the per capita per worker is one hundred dollars. Okay. So therefore, when you compare data for per capita and per worker, because you cannot find any country where there is one hundred percent labor participation rate, per worker value is always high. Okay. Always have it. So, good, which I explained already. Okay. So now, which I already explained. If you look at this, you know, real data, okay, for these countries, now you can see, let's compare certain countries, Denmark and Netherlands, all right? These columns, one, represent GDP per capita. Which country people are, you know, the income is higher? The Danish people, they are earning more than Dutch people, right? Dutch people. But if you compare the labor participation rate, where in Denmark is 55%, in Netherlands it is 46%, when they cal calculate the per capita, now Danish, uh, you know, Dutch people are living much better compared to Danish people. Okay, which we really makes the difference because you know most of the people are economically you know they are not contributing to the economy here. Good, but if you compare it to these developing countries like Egypt and Pakistan, right, where because it's a developing country, which is you know participation rate is very low, which is informal sector is large in the economy, right. If you compare their, if you compare, compare their per capita to the U.S. American, so back Egyptians, they only their per capita makes only 13 percent of Americans, and 7 percent in case of Pakistan. But if you consider per worker and compare now, things are much different. Okay, living standards in here based on per worker is much better. This 3 percent, 5 percent difference. It's something very big difference in, in terms of compared to GDP. Okay, for example. Good. All right. Let's continue. As I already said, for those students who came late, uh, there is no break. Okay. So if you would like to go, you can go. All right. Sound bad. All right. So Lord, even though we know another issue which you're already familiar with, income inequality in the in the, in the country or among the countries, right? We have countries which are very rich. It doesn't mean that everyone they are receiving the same, right? Maybe there are only 10% of the population, they are earning 90% of the total income, right? So now, this data represents for all countries. This is the world, you know, world population, okay? This is world income. Right. World income. So now, if you look at Gini, you know Gini coefficient, right? Yes. Gini coefficient, which gives us the higher the value, the, the higher inequality level in the country. 
country. So loud. If so, this curve we call Lorenz curve, right? Lorenz curve. So the the further away it is from the line of equality, the higher level of income inequality in the in the country, right? So data for 1960 it shows that it was 50. 0.59. After many years now, it is now 0.52. Income inequality in the world is still high, but if you compare it to the past, now it's much better. Right? There is change. But, and if you compare for further years, in two thousand, it was 0.51. Okay. I tried to figure out whether you know, there are other and from I, I, I figured out from CIA data, okay, it shows that 38, 2000. Much different. But the issue is, even though there is slight things are on average, you know, on average, it's improving, the bottom, 5 to 10 percent, power, okay, that, you know, here, see, the situation has not changed. Okay, it did not change. Income inequality is still high. Okay, good. So now, now look at this graph again. Data from 1988, okay? Income distribution among nations. You can see this blue color represented for, it is for developed countries. You can see that their income, these are income, okay, $5,000, one, uh, uh, $10,000, okay? So the income, on average, they are receiving, it's high. But in India, those people who are receiving less income, okay? This color, dark uh, brown color, it represents China, okay? You can see that most of Chinese people, their income was less than $500. You know, in early 1980s, poverty level in China was over 80 percent, right? In rural areas, it was over 95 percent poverty, absolute poverty level, okay? But over the years, things has changed. Now, after so more than 10 years, things has changed a lot, right? Now you can see how Chinese living today, whose income was less than $500, namely but now it is almost 5,000, you see? In the world, income inequality, okay, poverty level, it's reduced mainly because of China. Because in India, things like has improved mainly a lot. And another disappointing figure in here, you can see, this thing called, thing called, which represents Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? You can see that income inequality in here it was not very severe, right? Severe. But over the years now it's it's so much. Even the very bottom it has increased so much. Both income inequality and power to life. Alright? So these are the richest nations in the world according to 1960s. 1960 and 1998 data, all right? In 1960, oh sorry, poorest, okay? Tanzania was the poorest nation in the world, okay? And if you look at the data, okay, real GDP per worker relative to US, so there, per capita was, it made only 2.3% compared to America. Very poor nation, okay? And, in 1998, it was 1.6. So, if you look in here, this column, third column, represents growth, long run growth, okay? Average growth. Let's also China and Romania, which were the poorest countries in 1960, okay? Because of economic growth, high growth, right, over the years, if you look at these poorest nations in 1998, they are not in the Okay? Because in 1998, their living standards have improved much better now. They are living much better. Alright? 
much better. And then after 1990, they were doing even better regarding China. But if you look at poorest nations in 1998, we have some again, Niger, Mali, Madagascar, Central African Republic, Nigeria, <coughs> where their income compared to US in 60 was this much, okay? But after the years, it's much lower. See? Why? Because they have negative growth over the years, which means life well being in the countries. Decline and decline and decline. Good. And now these are richest ones, okay, 15 richest. In 1960, Switzerland was at the top, following the with New Zealand. Alright? If you look at their growth, some of them they were growing relatively good. For developing countries growing on average 3.2, it means something very great. And some of them, including in here, you can see Venezuela with negative growth. Okay? In 1998, you know, they are they, compared to us, they were, where, where was it? <coughs> Venezuela. They were living almost close to Americans after the years. It looks like this. Okay? And now look New Zealand, Venezuela, Argentina. They were the richest nations. But in 1998, you cannot find them in here as richest, okay? Because their growth was low, all right? But in 1998, we have Ireland and Hong Kong as newly added members, as richest nations, okay? Why? The growth rate in Hong Kong was on average 5.6, where there were people that they, in Hong Kong in 1960 Relative to American, it was 80.9, but now it's almost close to that. Irish people too, okay? Seems, which means they got a growth in the economy, really improve, improve people's well-being, okay? Good? So again, if you now look, these 10 lowest growth, all growths are negative. If you compare this data, you can see how you know, lives worsen in these nations, okay? And which we call as growth disasters, okay? Because it's negative. On the other hand, these kind of China, South Korea, tigers, so the Asian tigers are here, okay? Average growth in these countries are very high. Therefore, lives has improved so dramatically over the years, which we call them Growth miracles. Okay? Growth disasters and growth miracles. Okay. Good. So now you can see from all countries. Some countries, they like Nigeria, they were doing economically very well, but in the long run of the year, things have improved. Rich country became very poor. Or there are many cases like Hong Kong, very poor country became very rich. Okay? So in the long run. Good. Question. What do you think? What are the main reasons for some South Saharan and Middle East countries not being able to grow over time? Instability. Instability. One is instability. So in, in Middle East, it started just recently, right? Instability. It really worsened the situation. But in many, many African countries, you know, they are trapped in poverty. Things is not improving. They're trapped. Okay? Trapped. Why? Even though there is no water. So there are many things, okay? When you consider your, your variables, you will consider those, you know, uh, political variables too, okay? So political situation is not good there. There are some kind of tribal conflicts always that always causes negative <coughs> Okay? Good. Convergence. Now we will start talking about convergence, which is important for you. I think you know what convergence means, right? Which means that you can't equal, right? One student is very, your father is very tall compared to you, but after the years, we will reach his 
is converged, your high level converged. So what? So what? According to convergence, so what? There is very interesting idea in economics. Okay, which means that poverty will disappear by itself in the future. So if everything you know is stable, even though there is poverty level now, it will disappear in the future. Why? Because countries they on average grow. Growth means things will improve. Okay. And another thing is countries that start with low per capita, <coughs> they will be growing faster compared to those countries which start with high per capita. Is it true? Yes. Americans, yes. let's say their per capita is 50,000 US dollars, right? And let's say on average their growth rate is 2%, right? And there are so many countries where the per capita is $1,000 only, 50 times different, okay? On average, if you compare, those countries with very low per capita, their growth rate is much higher than 2%. All right? High per capita, it means their economy is already mature. It's an modification, which means that their infrastructure is very good. Good technologies are already applied, right? For example, for European countries to become, you know, industrialized nation, okay, it took 150 years. It took 150 years industrialization process, but for China it took less than 30 years. They reached same industrialization level within less than 30 years. For them, it took really, really short time. Why? Cheaply. Population. Technology. Okay, you all are good assets. Okay. So Chinese became so super powerful. One reason because of Europe. Why? Because Europeans they were starting everything from scratch. They were the ones who invented so those technologies, okay? We Chinese they bought them or they, they imitated some of them and they were reaching very fast growth because it was already established business. Okay? So it was the reason why they were growing fast. Same thing. Now, if you come into the United States, everything is established. While in a, in, a, in a poor country, nothing has established yet because there is already everything is available in the world, they will be establishing the economy, applying. So growth will be much higher. Okay? So China, for decades, they were, they were growing double digits, more than 10%. Growth merit, right? But it slowed down now. It will be slowing down. From next uh, lecture, we will be talking about solar model, where, where we have this A, which, which represents technology, which really makes the difference. Okay? Good. There are three types of convergences, okay? First one is absolute convergence. Second one is conditional convergence. Third one is club convergence. In your coursework, you should apply one. And I believe you will get, you may apply conditional convergence or club convergence. Okay, one. So now I will explain what are they. First one, absolute convergence. What is absolute convergence? Absolute convergence, okay, it means that it's the thinking that because this developing country their growth rate is higher, right? It's two percent, now it's five percent. Over the years, this country's economy will converge because U.S. economy is growing slower, by these countries, the economy is growing faster. So in the long run, it will converge. This is the absolute convergence theory. All country doesn't matter. The richest country in here, because it's growing slow, slow. Here, poor country is growing fast. All countries, you know, they will be approaching one fast. In the long run, all people's life will be the same. In capital it is absolute convergence. Okay. So, which means that those countries which start with low per capita, their growth rate is high. Those countries which start with high per capita is low. We will see whether it's true or not. Okay? 
For example, William Baumol in his paper, he did research, okay, and he applied data for 100 years period to feel that the long run effect, and he really found that it is true. Okay? So look, I tried to draw these lines. I got the data from uh, World Pen Tables, okay? And I wrote, does it indicate convergence? Is there any tendency for convergence? Yeah, there is, right? See? These countries, the economies were very different, you asked, okay? Very different. So now if you look, they are converging, which means that, oh, it seems that it's true. So now, look, what's the foreign aid you know, right? We are now we have the United Nations, right? And we have many other NGOs. They are trying and they are encouraging rich developed countries. Now we have to contribute. People in some parts of the world that are very poor, now we have to help them. So poverty level should be elevated. Right? But now, by saying that absolutely convergent, we are saying that in the long run it will disappear. And what, what's the, if you know, which means that if we spend money, it still it will disappear. We are wasting our money, isn't it true? It's not true. Okay? So all rich countries, they must help. Why? Even though there is convergence, let's say it's true, okay? But giving foreign aid, this avoiding poverty level in early years will be easier. Okay? Easier. So which means that foreign aid is still needed in the economy. Okay. So now you can, as we already explained, those countries with low GDP per capita growing faster compared to and in other words, you know, average growth in GDP per worker from year zero to year T, it has negative correlation. Which means that this low per capita growth rate is higher. Low, high. High, low. All right? And now if you look at that, uh, you know, uh, there was a for those countries, there was regression analysis made, done, okay? And now, this is reg regression one, and these dots, this plot, they represent those countries, okay? How do these results look like? Do they look good? They look very nice, okay? Why? Because all these countries are close to the regression line, which indicates the significance of the results, okay? And it is indeed negative. Countries with a low per capita, it's low, okay? Low per capita, their growth rate is high. Or countries with high, you ask, their growth rate is low. These were the results, okay? So this, regarding this growth rate, we will consider, we will have exercises. You can see, these are regression results for this one. The model is given, so the coefficient is negative, okay? 0.5. R squared is 4 or 5%, which is relatively okay, even though the sample is not big, okay? And T statistic is 4 or 5, which is highly significant. So which means that we cannot ignore these results if it's true, okay? Good. So these results, they are supported, right? You can see that these things are okay. You have absolute conversion is true. But it ignores the issue of there is a problem of sample selection bias. Why? These countries, we can include all the rich countries. The infrastructure, the economy is all the same. Which means that we did not include other countries. So now we make a big mistake in here. Alright? So now, but once we now, they try to include more countries, developing, develop, different infrastructures, different economies. Now, look at this regression line. And look at these dots. Very spreader here and there. And it, it's even positive, which is against the theory. 
all right, against the theory. Now, can you say that it's significant now? Yeah. It is insignificant and incorrect, which tells us absolute convergence is not true. It does not work in real life. <coughs> So here, more countries were included, okay? Here, how do we, how you, you try to avoid bias, sample selection bias? Population with less than two million was ignored, okay? And those oil rich countries were removed from here. Okay? Good. So next one. So Lord, we said saving rate is important, right? Investment is important. Countries will save more. They will be investing more. Does it have positive relationship to the uh, to economic growth or negative? Positive. More investment, which means that in the future, this economy will, will grow even closer because they're investing more. They are building more and more capital is accumulated. Okay? Good. Second one. Some countries, they try to spend more on human capital. Does human capital play any role in the economy? Yes. Yes, right. Which means that if countries, they are spending more on human capital, that, you know, effective labor will grow, more literacy, right? Which means that they will be contributing more to the economy. Which means in the future, they, they will expect positive growth. Yes? Okay. What about population? Population is growing, right? Which means the more population, it should be allowed that per capita should be, uh, the GDP should be allowed to more people. If more population grows, does it grow the income? It's disproportional, but on average it doesn't, right? It is negative. One issue with South Saharan Africa is, even though there is poverty level, I think that fertility rate is very high. And you know the case of China and Korea, where group up with that birth rate was very high. In South, uh, in China, they implemented a strict one-child policy, right? And now they're struggling now the population is going down slowly. In South Korea, they also, you know, even though they made it forcible, but they did voluntary by, you know, all of those in, uh, Talking about advertising, have two children is good, good education you can give, one even better, but now they are doing vice versa because, because the population is going negative. Okay? Of course, there are these kind of exceptions too. Good? So, which means these are structural characteristics of countries, alright? Structural characteristics. In order to avoid problems, okay, in convergence, you know, control variables, right? Control variables. <laughs> Let's say my income is $5,000. And her income is also $5,000. Whose consumption is higher? Because your income is, you know, same, your consumption should be same, right? But if we control our family situation, where I have wife and two, three more children, where she's not there yet, which means my consumption should be high, right? I'm controlling this data fairly. So now, if absolute convergence data is controlled by structural characteristics, things should well improve. Okay? Good. Conditional convergence. So which means that countries in the long run, they will converge. Okay? But based on their structural characteristics, which means that those countries with infrastructure, okay, where you know, human capital is nicely established, and then you know, investment rate, is the saving rate is relatively good, less population growth, so okay, those are satisfied, these countries, they will converge, which means that and according to absolute conversion, we said that those poverty level will disappear, right? But this conditional convergence says it does not argue that it will disappear. 
there are some countries here. Human capital is not properly established. Saving rate is very low. The situation, it will, this country will not converge. It will converge if human capital is established. Okay? So it will go to this path if those conditions are satisfied. Do you understand? Okay. All right. So I hope, uh, okay. Now, if you look at this econometric model, we see that average grows, okay, for, for many years. And this is the initial GDP per capita, okay? And this Z represents control variables, where we control for those structural characteristics, okay? Good. So let's say this is S represents, okay? GDP share of gross investment in physical capital, okay? And it represents average gross rate for all countries. So now, apply exactly the same data that you got very bad picture, right? By gi giving these control variables. Now you can see the results, okay? Now, the regression line is negative. And now, dots are much closer to this line, which indicates the significance level, all right? So which means, if you are building that convergence model, and you are very capable, and you found really nice variable that you can control for structural characteristics, you will get really nice results, okay? So which tells us countries this conclusion in the long run, they will converge to the same path based on those structural characteristics. Okay? Structural characteristics. And what's the role of 4 and 8? In the first case, we, are, we argued that those countries, in 8, 4 and 8, given today for poor countries, the poverty level will be elevated. So people, it will be easier for people. But in conditional one, we said that poverty will not disappear. But foreign aid is very important. There are so many con conditions. And saving rate and the financial system is in very poor condition. condition okay? If these countries are able, the developed countries, they are giving foreign aid, they will be able to build their human capital, which is conditional for future growth. They can improve their financial situation. By human doing, if they improve those conditions, so these countries will converge in the future. Okay? Good. And the last one is club convergence. So they are making additional credit. Yes, conditional is true. But growth paths should they are different. They are according to club convergence, they are considering you know, threshold values. Threshold. Let's say group of countries, right? According to plot conversion, there are several threshold values. Right. You know, countries will converge to the level of U.S. Okay? So, in the long run, they will converge. Conditional. But there is a threshold value. Okay? Which means that if per capita, let's say, $30,000, okay? Let's suppose. This is right. So those countries with per capita over 30, they will convert to that pass. If it's less than this one, they have gross pass here, let's say here, it will be different. Those countries, you know, between 10 and 20, their gross pass is different. These countries, their convergence in here. Those countries in, in the bottom, theirs is different. Okay? So which means there are club convergence. This rich class conversion is different. You know, the middle class conversion is different. Poor class conversion is different. Okay? Maybe in your coursework, if you consider that Uzbekistan as a middle class, maybe the conversion is different. Who knows if you draw? But it's not long run. If you are not able to find that data because it starts from 1991. Okay? You, are not, you will fail anyway. But in the second one, second group, if you are able to find it, well, who knows? Okay. Anyway, what if you only four uh, countries are on the same level, it means convergence already happened. 
No, no, I will show you for Uzbekistan and those countries, okay? I don't know whether it's here, but definitely in, in seminar slide, in that we, I, I try to draw. There is some kind of convergence, okay? It's another case, all right? Threshold that. Good? So, like this. Different threshold values. And what's the role of foreign aid in here? Foreign aid. So look, foreign aid is very important. So look, now this is the richest group, right? Cloud, they're converging. There is that one country in here, this is the illustration by one country, which is 29, right? The threshold in their the convergence is different. Because they don't have more than 29. If they have 30 or 30, their conversion in the long run would be different. So therefore, if there is more than a given for this country to make it 30, so which means that in the long run their conversion will be in much better situation. Do you understand? This is the role of convergence. Those very poor countries, their conversion is different. If you give them, they will be in a better, among better economies in the world. Okay? Good. All right. Summary or conclusion of those, you already know, absolute conversion, they say it's all can they will convert in the future, but we see that it's not true, that there is biasness. Conditional convergence, if the structural characteristics are nicely controlled, it will really happen. And cloud convergence, that we have to consider threshold values as well. Okay? Good. Steady long run grows. Okay. If you consider data, uh, which is uh, unfortunately not available mainly, right, for many years, if you could see, draw, if you have you know, 1,000 years of data, you could see very beautiful picture. Growth rate of one country, if you just plot that 100 years, again, that grows, okay, you can see straight line, okay? Because there is always business cycle in the economy, right? Sometimes it booms, sometimes it creates a recession, so it is like this, right? But if it's thousands of years, it will, if you look at from distance, which you will see from very long distance, it will look like straight line. Okay. So these are hundred more than one hundred years of data plotted, okay, for U.S. economy and for Denmark. If you look, they are really experienced. This is natural growth rate for years. And it looks that the economy is always growing. Of course, these are the times of crisis and war. Yes, Great Depression in the United States, right? And here, war time of, there was exception, the war, the war time they became super powerful, okay? So, then on the other hand, you can see there is grows pass in the long run. If you make it to 1,000, it will be just look, looking like straight line. On average, the conclusion of all countries, they grow. For UK economy, okay. This recession because of World War I, one and two, okay. In Netherlands, this is also because of war. Sweden and Finland, you can see this data. All of them, you can see that they are growing over the years. Right? Good. And another thing, another factor is now income per capita is growing, right? What about population? Is it growing? Population is also growing, right? And now we can see that, you know, in early uh, neoclassical economies, they used to say, in the future situation, you know, poverty level over the years will become worse and worse and worse. Because there will be more population, the consumption will be more and more. But in the future, it's shown that it's vice versa. Now, if you compare the data of today with 50, 100 years, now people are living many, many, many times better compared to the past. Which means that those classical economies, they were wrong. Because we have the technology, you know, we develop many other things, and we are growing, right? And now we can see the same situation has is improving. 
which means that income is even growing faster than population. This is one indication. Okay? So now. So if you can see the balance grows, balance grows, this is the conclusion. So at least you know economy is steadily growing, which means that everything is steadily growing too. Income is growing, population is not you know overgrowing, okay? So the savings in the economy is probably done, okay? So those all of those factors management growth probably grow. So this is the book. What time is it now? One hour and thirty minutes. So our lecture is all the students. So now this is the Sorensen's book, Introduction and Introducing Advanced Macroeconomics. Okay. If you read these pages, everything is there. There are certain things that I missed to tell you, and there are many things that I added. Okay? So this is the importance of the lecture. And please do not miss your seminars. seminars okay? That's a very good chance for all of you to get everything from there. Good?